The Witness is a puzzle-based video game unlike anything that I've ever played before. The experience was simple and minimalistic, yet profound. When you start the game, you wake up in a long tube, and after opening the door, you realize that you are underground. As you make your way out of this bunker, you are met with the view of a mountain far off in the distance. You soon realize that you are locked inside this small area, and have to solve a few panels of puzzles to earn your freedom. Without a single line of dialogue, with no tutorial or list of rules, no manual present offering operating instructions, no narration or obnoxious character giving you verbal cues, this entire section of the game just taught you the necessary fundamentals that are needed to navigate this world. Not only that, but they have given you a clear direction towards the goal that you should aim for. It was after this simple introduction and interaction with the mechanics that I realized that I was playing a very special game. There are no tutorials. The developers went to great lengths to teach you everything you need to know about the game's mechanics from the gameplay itself. They encourage trial and error, and utilizing context clues to learn the rules of the puzzles. These panels of puzzles are present everywhere on the island. They are how you interact with things, how you make progress, gain access to new areas, and how you advance the story. Each area has different rules to the puzzles, which greatly encourages you to explore and learn those rules. You'll quickly learn that the rules of the puzzles can be combined together, which will add a varying degree of complexity. Each area also has its own unique problems and solutions, which mirrors the real world, something that the game alludes to quite often. Players are given a myriad of puzzles to solve, and various rewards when those puzzles are solved. Most often, solving problems is rewarded with more problems. You finish one puzzle, and the next immediately lights up. This too is similar to how the real world works. Eventually though, once you solve enough problems, new paths will open, doors will unlock, switches will activate, power will be restored and rerouted and the island will slowly begin to open up to the player. This reward is a unique one. It's so simple, yet it emphasizes a very key message. This part of the game reinforces to the player that they can affect change in the world. Using your intellect to solve problems can change your circumstances, which may ultimately lead you to getting new opportunities. This simple aspect of the game can be extrapolated and applied to everyday life. It's an interesting notion that postulates a personal responsibility within each of us. If we aren't as far along as others, or if they're not as far along as we are, it indicates that perhaps there are certain challenges or problems that have not yet been resolved in their journey or our own. This is an interesting application of the game's basic nature, yet it's an important one, but we'll talk about this a little later. Once players work their way through an entire area, they are rewarded with one of the most notable features of the game. A giant laser, housed within a yellow structure, is activated and proceeds to fire a beam at an object at the top of the mountain. This signifies that the player has completed this area and can proceed to the next one of their choosing. For those more curious journeymen, a trip up the mountain reveals your current goal. Each laser unlocks a latch on a yellow box which is held by a stone statue. You quickly understand that you only need to activate 8 lasers to proceed, but as you get further into the game and become more familiar with the island, you'll soon realize that the game has more than 8 lasers. Perhaps this means something, but I'm sure if you continue progressing through the areas, it will all make sense eventually. Jonathan Blow directed The Witness. His previous game, Braid, was a puzzle platformer and had sold relatively well. He used the money that he earned from Braid to fund the budget for The Witness. Building a small team around himself, 
they got to work. The game took seven years to develop, in part because the initial concept kept growing and evolving in scope as the team grew. It cost just under $6 million to produce a game of this caliber, and the engine that runs it is made from scratch. The game was created and coded in Jai, a programming language written by Blow himself. The reason to go to all of this trouble was so they could have complete creative control over every aspect of the game's creation. The main action of the game, Drawing a Line, had come from a previous game that Blow had worked on. In that game, players were required to draw the shape of a symbol if they wanted to cast a spell. But the issue that arose was the why. What purpose did players have for drawing a line when instead they could just push a button and get the same result? Jonathan experimented with augmentations to this system. How you drew the symbol would now dictate what the properties of the spell were. Let's say the two intersecting lines and a swirl would be the spell to cast a fireball. The parts of the symbol would represent the different aspects of the spell. How long the vertical line was could indicate the length of time the status effect burn would be applied to the target. The height of the point of the intersection could indicate the base damage of the fire spell. The size of the swirl could indicate the area of effect that the spell would have. Changing these values would augment how much mana the spell would require to be cast. This creative mentality was translated into The Witness, only here we're not drawing lines for customization. The game necessitates the why. We are solving puzzles to beat the game. The differing shapes and lines we draw are now the solutions to the questions of each puzzle. The shape and path we choose are a direct reflection of our intellect. This line, solving and answering the question of each unique challenge, twisting and winding its way through every area of the island, is how the player navigates through the world of the witness. Beyond opening doors and gaining access to new areas and puzzles, the rewards offered to the player in The Witness are far more nuanced than most games. Usually, when you complete a task or a quest in a video game, you get rewarded with gear that has better stats, cosmetic items that make your character look cooler, or the game's currency which you can use to buy whatever you want. The better gear can help improve your experience with the game by making menial tasks faster or easier to accomplish. The cosmetic items can make you want to play more so you can flex your hard-earned rewards. In The Witness, the biggest reward you get is the knowledge of how to solve the puzzles. It's not your character that changes, it's you. As you proceed through the game, you learn more and more rules. You hone your solving skills and apply that knowledge to new challenges. You personally grow and start to feel a sense of pride as you wander around the island and see every problem that you've solved, and every door that you've opened. Even the lasers are simple reminders of your mastery of each type of challenge. In the game, only your knowledge, or lack thereof, holds you from progressing to different areas. This becomes the greatest reward, that learning a skill and building knowledge can open up so much for you in the future. Once you've mastered every area in the game, and activated all 11 lasers, it's time for you to run the biggest puzzle gauntlet that The Witness has to offer. You're ready to attempt the challenge under the mountain. Once all 11 lasers have been activated, go to the yellow box on the top of the mountain and finish the true puzzle. You'll see a power strip light up, and this is how you will know that you are ready to begin. Make the descent into the mountain, solve all of the puzzles, keep pushing until you get to the second to last room, and stop once you see the statue of the creator. 
The power cable has turned on the tablet he is using. Solve the puzzle and gain access to a hidden corridor off to the side of that room. Enter this cave system and solve as many puzzles as you want. Only one of them is necessary. Solve the circular puzzle on the column and gain access to the next hidden area. Welcome to the challenge. This is the hardest feat to accomplish in The Witness, and for good reason. The challenge is a gauntlet of 14 puzzles that are randomly generated each time you attempt them. As you solve them, they increase in complexity. If you enter a wrong solution, you will deactivate the puzzle you're working on and will have to travel back to the previous puzzle to re-enter the correct solution. Except it will change the puzzle you failed to a brand new one. Here is the layout of the challenge. The first three puzzles are a simple set of maze and segregation puzzles. Next, there is a very important chessboard looking puzzle, but we will come back to this. The next group of four puzzles are randomly generated, not only by type, but also by location. There is a maze, a segregation puzzle, a shapes and stars puzzle, and a symmetrical puzzle. Once that area is clear, you have two groups of three monitors. These are segregation puzzles, but two of the three are unsolvable. So you have to figure out not only which ones are actually solvable, but the solution for them as well. Next, you will go into the life-size maze. Here is where the chessboard comes into play. This puzzle will show you the layout for the maze. You have to keep this puzzle solution in your head because the line breaks are walls that will shoot up and block your path in the maze and the yellow dots represent the locations of the two arrow puzzles that you have to solve in order to activate the final two puzzles of the challenge. Two symmetrical pillar puzzles, one segregation and one where you must collect all of the dots. All of that probably doesn't seem too difficult, except for one small detail. In order to start the challenge, you have to activate a record player that spins up and plays music for six and a half minutes. The only music that appears in The Witness is found in the challenge. For six and a half minutes, you hear two classical music selections from Edvard Grieg's Peer Gint Suite. The first is Anitra's Dance. The second is probably Grieg's most famous piece, a song that most people have heard, but few know the name of. It is a song that makes it significantly harder to focus and solve the puzzles. A song that builds anxiety as it crescendos with its pulse-pounding melody. This song is none other than In the Hall of the Mountain King. The challenge is interesting for a few reasons. If you didn't do the work necessary to solve all of the puzzles in the main game yourself, you will have a difficult time completing it. This is where the players who really understand the mechanics get separated from those who followed guides and looked up the answers to the game's more difficult areas. The randomization ensures that only those who understand the game and who put in the time learning how the puzzles and rules work will succeed. It is they who will be victorious and claim the reward for their hard work. The final, last piece of the puzzle. They are rewarded with the final hexagonal puzzle solution. This will give players access to the longest video clip in the game. But I'm not going to tell you what that is. That knowledge must be earned and is part of the larger story.
Located throughout the island are certain doors that offer very difficult puzzles for you to solve. These are some of the hardest individual puzzles in the game, and usually combine two or three rules together to offer incredible complexity. Once you gain access, you will find a safety deposit box that gives you a unique solution to the hexagonal puzzle in the theater. Entering the correct pattern will unlock a video clip that delves into a philosophical or religious topic. One of the clips is the ending scene from Tarkovsky's Nostalgia. In your journey up to this point, you've probably run across some tape recordings left on the island full of wisdom and the musings of philosophers, theologians, scientists, and the scholars of old. They offer a unique insight into the nature of reality, the nature of man, the existence of God, and the perceptions that we have of the world around us. I thought this was an interesting approach to the game and its story. No commentary is offered about the quotes, just that there are quotes. Many times I felt that the quotes were directly tied to the area in which I found them. One of these aha moments that I had was when I was listening to a quote by Nicholas of Cusa, speaking of the visible and the invisible attributes of God. This was when I was solving the symmetry puzzles, and in one section of the puzzles, the opposing line that you control gets fainter and fainter with each solution until it becomes completely invisible to you. The puzzles now mimic the quotes that were left on the island. While these recordings are beautiful and contain a broad spectrum of belief, their purpose isn't really revealed unless you can get to the secret cave before the challenge. There, some of the recordings appear normal, but have a behind-the-scenes conversation that happens once the quote is finished. It is here confirmed that the purpose of the quotes, and the island itself, is an experiment to help people gain an understanding of other people's beliefs and worldviews. A group of scientists in charge of creating the island picked out the quotes specifically. They tried to represent different schools of thought so that the subject of the experiment, the person solving the puzzles on the island, would be offered this information in as broad and unbiased a way as possible. The scientists were using memory-blocking substances on themselves and putting themselves on the island so that they could run through the challenges and receive the information with eyes unclouded. In one of the recordings, it is revealed that one of the scientists who was previously a materialistic atheist would scoff at those who believe the stories of the Bible. He thought that there was no way that anyone could put their faith in such outlandish and miraculous tall tales. After experiencing the island and its challenges, however, it is revealed that he grew especially attached to the theological writings of Nicholas of Cusa. He mentions that he no longer finds it perplexing that people can place their faith in something that cannot be seen, yet is said to be present everywhere. This twist in the game's story is especially interesting because the player soon comes to the realization that this exact experience is happening to themselves. You, the player, have been put on this island for a purpose, and you are experiencing this unique transformation. As I look back on my own experience playing through the game, I realize that I was excited to find every recording, to gather every piece of the puzzle, to hear every person's unique perspective, and to test it against my own worldview. This process was not argumentative, but civil. Not turbulent, but tranquil. It was only me and the ideas. Me, on the island, floating on the ocean amidst a sea of thoughts and personal philosophies of some of the greatest minds to have ever lived. It's hard to describe, but it was a uniquely beautiful experience getting to observe these various perspectives of the world. Perspective plays a very integral role in The Witness, not only thematically with how you as an individual consider the views of other people, but also physically. There is an entire subset of puzzles that exist in this game, and that live outside of the panels. It's hard to describe the epiphany that I had when I realized this. It happened when I spotted a perfect circle from a distance. 
It was the top of a tree, and it had a small line sticking off of it. Thinking it strange, I began to mess around, and quickly realized that I had found something very unique. Oh snap. I just so I just noticed something was interesting, and... Uh-huh. I will say the puzzles go deeper than we think they do, my dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to the third collectible, my guy. Okay. I've I've got very many of them. What did that just do? Oh, hey, yeah. Welcome to the game, baby. It's puzzles on puzzles. What did that it's just puzzles do, dude? With collectible puzzles. All about your puzzles, baby. What? It's, it's, it's a fantastic game, dog. This <laughs> is a super cool game. What do do? <laughs> Anywhere that you see a perfect circle and a line following it, chances are there is a real-life perspective puzzle waiting for you. This adds such a layer of depth to the game that it's hard to quantify the effect that it has on the player. You quickly begin to walk around looking for puzzles that can be solved everywhere. Every rock, shadow, tree, wall, building, or object can become a piece of the puzzle. This not only introduces a new level of challenge to the game, but also a new philosophical challenge as well. When you solve a normal panel puzzle, you have truthfully and objectively solved it. Now, when you're attempting to solve one of the obelisk puzzles, even if you know what path leads to a solution, the game requires you to be standing in the correct position. The complexity that arises from these puzzles is directly correlated to the extremity of the perspective needed to solve them. Sometimes that requires movement with an elevator or boat. Sometimes you have to move an object or change something in the real world to be able to line up the path needed to solve the puzzle. While solving these puzzles is definite, I believe this is the developer's way of illustrating a subjective solution to real world puzzles. The answer is bound by a particular perspective, and therefore becomes subjective to the one who is attempting to solve it. You can't just solve it in any way, even if you know the answer. You have to use the right distance, angle, and location to be able to correctly solve them. This style of puzzle alone re-emphasizes one of the biggest themes of The Witness. I'm sure you have heard it said many times, speak your truth. This cultural colloquialism, while good-natured, is an apt display of a fundamental misunderstanding of truth itself. Objective truth is not swayed or changed by subjectivity. Just because something feels right or seems true from someone's particular perspective doesn't mean it is. If two people are in a car accident and both think that the other person is at fault, a third party is needed to assess the situation and determine who was in the wrong. When people claim to speak their truth, what they are really divulging is their perspective, shrouded in their own personal circumstances, biases, prejudices, and experiences. It may appear to be true, it may coincide with the truth, it may even be true from that perspective, but that doesn't mean it is objectively true. When a witness is called into a courtroom to share their testimony, this is not considered truth, it's considered evidence. People are flawed, they misremember things, they might exaggerate certain details or omit others completely. It's the job of the prosecution to provide enough of this credible evidence that the case made against the defendant is either clear and convincing or beyond a reasonable doubt to get the jury to rule in their favor. What's so amazing about The Witness is that the game developers have gathered the evidence, but they leave it up to the player to form their own conclusions based on that material. It's one of the best examples I have ever seen of a game that attempts to lead the player into some form of objective truth. It asks players to act as the jury, not as the judge, or the prosecutor, or even the defendant. While the conclusions you come to as a player may still be subjective, at least they were presented in an objective, unbiased way. 
This is how the game gets you to solve the ultimate puzzle. Truth. The Witness mirrors life. This game teaches us lessons, puzzle by puzzle. As the challenges grow in complexity, our thinking and reasoning must grow as well. The voice recordings do the same thing on a philosophical scale by introducing various belief systems. The game encourages the player to approach them with the same mentality as they do the puzzles, to attempt to view them in a new perspective and to respect them. This is how The Witness introduces us to the ultimate puzzle of truth, and why this video game, from my own meager perspective, gets elevated into art. The answers that you have concluded in your own journey, the puzzles you have solved, the rules you have learned, the areas you've unlocked, the secrets you have found, all of these may have worked for you, but will they work for everyone? Is this answer that you have found subjective or objective truth? If you changed your perspective, does the answer still hold? Can you change your perspective? Is it possible for you to view the conclusions of someone that you completely disagree with with unbiased eyes? Can you determine what led them to draw a different conclusion than you? Do you even want to understand why they came to a different conclusion? All of this has led me to one singular idea. What if truth isn't a puzzle at all, but the key that solves the puzzle. These questions, the challenges that face us, our personal problems, life's struggles, all of the rules of existence and reality, they're out there, waiting to be discovered and then solved. There are answers. Solutions do exist. You just have to know where to look. This video was made possible by the awesome supporters on Patreon. Thank you all so much. If you want to get behind the scenes content and early access to new videos for free, please consider checking it out. Thanks for watching everyone. I'm Drew Malou, and I will see you storytellers in the next video.